This time it's five affordable classic British motorbikes. For many years now, the classic market has been filled with people who speculate or see old motorbikes as an investment rather than as what they actually are, which is, of course, a mode of transport to be enjoyed and treasured. But there are some bikes that are available for reasonably sensible money. Make no mistake, nobody's going to go out after this video and pick up a Triumph Bonneville for 800 quid or something. But there are machines which are within the budget of a normal human being rather than within that of an investment banker. So with that in mind, here are five affordable classic British motorcycles. The AGS and matchless big twins. The Phil Walker designed AMC Parallel Twins made their first appearance at the 1948 Earls Court Motorcycle Show and Walker's design did have some unusual features. It had four and a half camshafts rather like the Triumph engine and the machine used two separate barrels but without a doubt the most unique feature of the machine was the fact that it ran three bearing crank. This was pretty much unique amongst British Parallel Twins with a central bearing being mounted between two halves of the central flywheel and the crankshaft. A properly assembled this can result in a fairly sturdy bottom end, but unfortunately the design did not result in reduced vibration. Problematically, AMC were always slightly behind the curve when it came to engine development, because when everybody else went to 650cc in 1949-1950, they simply didn't have an engine ready, and they couldn't expand their engine out initially at least to 650. They would finally introduce a 600cc version in 1956, but it was already slightly smaller than the opposition and a few years behind. But the 600cc G11 is a very fine machine. It would later be replaced in 1959 by the G12650, with the enlargement of 646cc being achieved by lengthening the stroke. The bores are ready at their maximum to create the 600. Now the 650 was available essentially four different forms. There was the G12 standard, the Deluxe, the CS and the CSR, the latter two of course being the sports models with higher compression pistons. But although the sports machines offered comparable performance to most of their opposition, the machines did have something of an image problem. The styling of the bikes at the time was seen as something rather frumpy and old fashioned, so they were very much seen as old man's bikes. But a bigger problem was the poor relationship the company had with the press of the time. Because after a fallout with members of the press in the 1950s, AMC flat refused to let any of their machines go out for testing, which on reflection seems absolutely crazy. But the frumpy old man tag sticks even today, which is a shame because these are very good machines, with the only real problem the shortage of available spares compared to some other makes. But the fact is, compared to say Triumph or Norton, they offer comparable performance, especially in their CSR forms, and will cost you quite a bit less too. So an attractive bike at an attractive price. The BSA A65. Now when it comes to BSA parallel twins, the A65 and the A50 seem like that difficult second album when you compare them to the success and popularity of the earlier A10 and A7 models. And by comparison to the earlier bikes, the machines have a poor reputation as a vibrator, a leaker of oil and just plain less reliable. But is that actually true? As we often say in this channel, common knowledge is commonly wrong. So what about the A65? The A65 arrived with a star twin in 1962 and marks the move from a magneto ignition system to battery coil ignition. Other changes included a completely different bore and stroke. The engine was of course unit construction and the rocker box was essentially cast into glue with the head dispensing with those slightly leak prone separate rocker boxes that you see on similar models. And there was an all new cassette gearbox with an up for up pattern, similar to that found on Triumphs of the day. The machine all round had a cleaner, rounder look than the outgoing A10. And it was a fair bit lighter too. But unfortunately the reputation of the bike did suffer something of an early blow, when that battery coil ignition system gave a number of problems. 
That's right, Joe Lucas, the original Prince of Darkness. But that early 38 star twin did evolve rather quickly. 66 there was 12 volt electrics and also by that time there was the Spitfire, a genuine 120 mile an hour machine. Many of the bike's detractors will make great play about the bike's use of a shell bearing on one side. But regular oil changes will do a great deal to offset any problems. And after all, the same bearing was used on the A10. And given the type of rider the bikes are actually going to be used for today, they're unlikely to actually give any problems. And in fact, I recently read an article by one of BSA's US importers, and he stated that in actual fact, warranty claims on the A65 were no greater than pretty much any other machine of the day. Very late machines with their oil bearing frame and American styling are in fact very good machines and make a really good buy. The styling of course makes perfect sense when you realise that 80% of all BSAs made were imported straight to the United States. So is the A10 or the A65 better? Well I think it depends on what you're going to do with the bike. The A10 has slightly more character I'd say and the A65 vibrates a bit more. But it is quite a bit quicker, has better handling and better brakes. So if you're going to do some high speed riding, it's probably the one to go for. The Triumph T140 and TR7RV. Now if you say classic Bonneville to somebody, this is the bike to think of. Late 60s to early 70s, 650s. But for some Bonneville fanatics, the T140 is that kind of dodgy relative that pops around for tea and is really annoying and nobody likes him. Damned for its unloved all bearing frame and of course that harsher bigger motor. That all bearing frame came from BSA's work at motocross and is actually really good. It provides much better steering than many equivalent bikes of the age. And in fact, the machine even won Britain's Formula 750 championship during the mid 70s. The bike was criticized for having a very tall seat, but we had a 1973 model and found it to be absolutely fine. And this was Deb's bike, not mine. So she's only about five foot six and she fitted on the bike, no problem at all. So let's put that one to bed. The bikes in general are not that tall at all, actually. And as for the vibration, well, of course, the bigger engine does vibrate more, but it's also more relaxed. So it isn't spinning quite as quickly as an old 650 motor did. And plumb for the single carb Tiger version, and the vibration isn't too bad at all. Until you get over 90, of course, but then that's really plodding on for a classic bike, isn't it? And personally, I've always found that that smaller but smoother idea is a bit of an urban myth. You take a Tiger 100, for example, above, say, 55, 60 miles an hour, and they vibrate a lot. Then of course there's disc brakes, indicators, and a plentiful supply of spare parts. And of course, modestly priced. Well, by Bonneville standards at least. The thinking man's Bonnie? I think so. The Veloset LE. An inexpensive Veloset, you say? More chance of finding rocking horse poo, I'd say and you'd probably be right. Veloset singles are very popular and consequently rather expensive. But then there is the Veloset LE. Developed by Eugene Goodman in 1948, the LE in fact stood for Little Engine. It's as simple as that. And that little engine was a 200cc, initially 150cc, liquid-cooled side valve, flat twin with shaft drive. Then there's the hand gear change and pulse start on early models, and not forgetting that pressed steel chassis. So not your standard fare in any way, shape or form. And that's because the concept of the LE was different. It was a machine designed to appeal to the everyman, whoever that is. But unfortunately, like so many machines of its type before and since, the machine was not a commercial success. Because bikers scoffed at the styling and commuters, well, they just wanted something inexpensive to get around on. So they ended up buying a much cheaper Villiers machine instead. Which is a great shame because the LE is smooth, refined, comfortable, reliable and quiet so I had a great deal going for it although speed was definitely not one of its great attributes but unfortunately Veloset was just too small for the economies of scale that would have made the bike more affordable but fortunately the bike did win favour with rural police forces who enjoyed its smoothness, reliability and of course its quietness much better to sneak up on those rural criminals if they can't hear you coming so there are still quite a few of these bikes around so if you're looking for something different you could do a lot worse than the LE Villiers powered commuter bikes. It's all too easy for the riders of later Japanese bikes to just pour scorn all over Villiers machines. But the Villiers engines were designed for a very different purpose. And pre-war Villiers engines were available for things like water cooling and automatic oiling. 
But of course, the years immediately after World War II were very austere in the United Kingdom. So items such as liquid cooling and automatic oiling fell by the wayside of the need for cheap, reliable and economical transport at the lowest possible price. Early post-war machines used plain bearings at the bottom end, so a lot of smart riders often used mineral oils only in these bikes. However, the later machines from the 1960s onwards, they used roller bearings, so it's very possible to use the extremely good modern two-stroke oils that you can get nowadays, and they will transform the reliability of these bikes because there's no doubt that the oil they gave you on the forecourt back in the 60s was pretty ropey stuff. Of course, Villiers engines were used across a very wide range of machines, so you can take the pick of pretty much any sort of style bike or company that you like. These engines are simple and easy to maintain, so they make a great first classic. But remember, restoring one will cost you almost as much as restoring a larger bike. But keeping one of these machines on the road should cost you an awful lot less. Of course, not all the two strokes are very cheap. Greaves are extremely popular back in the day and remain popular today, largely because they're excellent off road prowess. So, when it comes to Villiers mounted machines, Greaves is about as big as it gets. There are literally dozens of other names to choose from when it comes to Villiers powered bikes, with their two cylinder 2T engine in particular in a very pleasant motor to use. And while the days of the £200 Villiers bike, have long gone, they can still make a relatively inexpensive and fun way into classic biking. What other collections of bikes would you like to see in another video? Maybe you've got a bike that we can use for a test ride. Either way, get in touch. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.